Today we continue in our study and our summary of poetic books and today we're in the book of Proverbs. And what a wonderful collection of sayings of wisdom it is. <clears throat> we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer and then we want to give a summary and a discussion of the content of this book. I know that I don't spend as much time in Proverbs as I do Psalms, but it is, <clears throat> of course, part of this wisdom literature that most people spend a lot of time in, and so it's, a, it's an important book, and it gives us a lot of the surface truths about the realities in life. And so we want to look at it in just a moment after we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we may have <clears throat> true wisdom, which is wisdom given from you. We know that just knowing facts sometimes is not profitable, but the understanding of how facts and truth relate gives us real knowledge and wisdom. And so that's what we need. And we are told in this book that that. Fear of the Lord is where we start in learning wisdom with the right attitude towards you. And so we pray today as we come, as always it must be, that the Spirit of God would search our heart and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting, we pray. Lord, may we not be deceived by life and tricked by the deceitfulness of sin. May our study not be <clears throat> one of pride or incompleteness, but cause us to grow in the Word of God and in the knowledge of our Savior and the working of His will, we pray today. And as much of the Old Testament is, may this book and these words be for our example and our understanding, for our admonition to apply the truth to our lives that we may better and more correctly and rightly live for thee. We pray that it may be so. And Lord, we know that the word of God is profitable and that, that, that we may use it in the way, in the areas in which you've designed it for. And there is profit in this book in the word of God. And may we find it today, we pray. For it's in the name of our Savior that we ask these things. Amen. Of course, the name of this book comes from a definition of what its content is. And we must understand that these are not only short, compact sayings of truth, but we must understand that in the ancient world, in the, the world of Solomon, in the world of the ancient Chinese in the world of the Oriental, that this was a primary form of literature and preserving uh, records and communication that every ancient culture has sayings of wisdom within that culture and that these sayings are called uh, proverbs. That this, by definition, is what they are and that this is just not something we find in the Bible but it was a communication form of literature. Just as we would have the novel or the play or the short story or whatever form of literature that one would write in, the historic narrative or, uh, you know, this is a form of literature that the Holy Spirit adopted to convey these truths to us in the Old Testament. And we do know the author of most of the Proverbs, and the majority of them, of course, uh, <clears throat> came from the life of Solomon, who was, uh, is reported to be the wisest man, humanly speaking, that was ever on earth. Of course, the Lord Jesus was the sum of wisdom, but he was both God and man. But just a man, I guess Solomon in his wisdom was perhaps wiser than anyone else has ever been. And God gave it 
this to him as, as a purpose and a base for his ministry and his purpose in life. And of course we looked at that when we looked at the record of Solomon and Kings. It is a form of literature and expression. Solomon wrote most of them and of course uh, we know the authors of some of the others and maybe two or three of them are unknown. But uh, at least we know the author of most of the Proverbs in, in the book uh, and Solomon wrote most of them. According to uh, 1 Kings 4.32 in his life so Solomon uttered at least 3,000 recorded Proverbs. All of them aren't recorded here, but a, the portion that the Holy Spirit wanted us to know are recorded here. And so from this man of great wisdom and understanding came many utterances of truth out of which and from which the Holy Spirit has selected many to put in the Word of God, the Scriptures, and we have them here. In the book of Proverbs, of course, we have virtues exalted. Uh, this thing of wisdom itself is, is personified and exalted in the first part of the book and it explained the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Virtues of purity and honesty and truth and humility uh, are, are exalted in, in the book. Vices, uh, the, and the anger of men, the sin of men, the lust of men, the... Uh, the unrighteousness of men, the vices that come from the old nature are condemned and, and often times there is a contrast and a way of explaining truth is on one side God's working and truth and principle is exalted. On the other side vice and sin and the attitudes of unsaved men and the working of the world are contrasted. And so in the contrast of of this book in the exalting of virtues and the condemning of evil and the contrasting of the two the information is often presented and explained and taught and we have not only just moral virtue and this is not just a book about morality but is it is a book about the spiritual attitudes of the believing heart there are spiritual uh, emphasis here and spiritual principles involved so it it is not just the presenting of morality and of course God is for morality he's against lying and stealing and killing and, and, and cursing and profanity he's against all these things that uh, are wrong and evil in human nature and immorality and of course but the book goes far beyond just a list of moral ideas it goes to to the life and attitude and perspective of the child of God and the demonstrating of the works of salvation in that person's life. Of course, it's hard to outline this book, and I suppose that the outline given in the Schofield Bible in the introduction is as, as good as any. Uh, it, there are uh, several categories here given... Uh, uh, Chapters 1 through 9 are, are excerpt, fatherly exhortations uh, addressed mainly to the young. Uh, the second division is wisdom and, and fear of God trans, uh, contrasted with the folly uh, of sin, and that's in chapters 10 through 24. Uh, the third division, uh, Proverbs of Solomon, selected by men of Hezekiah in 25 through 29, and then Supplementary Proverbs by Agur and Lemuel 30 and 31. And so this is a general division of the book according to who wrote them and the content of the, the Proverbs as best that they can be uh, linked together in different segments. And so we see the divisions of the book. The uh, Proverbs book was completed around the 10th century and so we get some kind of idea about the completion and the, the finishing of this book and the time writing involved in it. Some of the things that Proverbs deal with, and of course there are several in the early part of the book that deal with this, and I, I know that as a, a young married man that, that I read uh, many of these Proverbs and benefited from their admonition 
Chapter 7, of course, is a proverb that deals with the importance of sexual purity in, in a person's life and in marriage, the folly of, of the sin of immorality. And, of course, one reading this information is struck by the, the uh, simple yet profound truth of the importance of these things. That one who lets immorality control his life is a slave to destruction and heartache and sin. But one who remains faithful to God avoids these problems in his life. And so this chapter 7 is a, is a chapter that uh, all of us need to read at all times, but especially people beginning their adult lives and, and consider the truth and the importance of what God has said in this area. Proverbs 16 is a proverb full of famous sayings that, that I just jotted down a few of them that, that we remember by heart, although we always don't remember where they are. That pride goeth before a fall. And of course, the attitude of our heart ought to be one of humility and not one of boastfulness or filled with our self-importance or what we can do. And so we... We often quote this proverb in life as, as a illustration to our children and a, and a remembrance to ourselves when we uh, talk about what we're going to do and then we see the folly of how that works out. And so we say pride goeth before a fall. In the same chapter there is this famous quote and the proverb, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The deception that men really believe they're going in the right way sometimes when they aren't. They convince themselves that what they believe is true and think that they're right. And that the, the need to examine and to pray and to carefully consider truth because of the propensity and the tendency of the old nature to, to deceive us even in that which we think is right. Sometimes, of course, we sin and do things knowingly that they're wrong. And sometimes we sin in ignorance and in deception because we think that we're believing and doing what's right when we're not. And of course this verse covers that important area and there's that admonition and there is that truth about the workings and the practices of men. In that same chapter, uh, an admonition that I uh, personally can and should benefit from that... Uh, <clears throat> that the man should be slow to anger, uh, that the man who's slow to anger is better than the mighty, one who can let the, the Lord control his spirit and his, his temper, his, his thoughts and his impulses. Uh, he has a, a, a benefit and a characteristic that's needed in life, and, and that, of course, is better than the mighty man who can do great acts, but... but will not allow the Lord to control his impulses and his thoughts and his anger. And then Psalm 22, we have the first verse that a good name is to be chosen over great riches and it contrasts the, the benefit of riches with the benefit of wisdom and the benefit of right in and, and, and this proverb. And in this proverb we have train up a child in the way that he shall go and when he's old he won't depart from it. The admonition to properly in those formative days of youth to put the knowledge of God in the, and put the revelation and the information about God before our children that they might properly believe and know that and that will be a means to, if not preserve them all through their lives, at least that knowledge may bring them back in the latter part of their life to doing what God wants them to do. In this uh, chapter, we have the admonition not to remove the ancient landmarks that are present, not to remove the great traditions, the great uh, uh, testimonies of truth in the working of God. And of course, in 2001, uh, the, the culture of our young people today is to sneer at the old-fashioned ideas of their grandparents. I, I would say their parents, but... Some of us parents were raised in days of, of departure and, and unbelief in the Word of God. And so the attitudes of parents 
today have only been amplified in the attitudes of children and there is such a difference in the attitude of young people today. Uh, and that great difference is not the result of a generation gap, it's the result of men in their great departure from truth over a long period of time. And this is the condition of life that we are brought to. And Proverbs 22 has some famous quotes in it. Proverb 31 is, is the proverb of Lemuel. And of course this is usually read on Mother's Day. or it's, a, it's, it's about a virtuous woman and how the, the qualities of a, a good wife or a, a virtuous woman, or qualities to be desired, and of great help. And, and so we, on special occasions, uh, read this passage of Proverbs, and we understand that women have an important, a vital, a necessary role and place in, in the lives of history, in the lives of this world, and in all of our lives. And so we've just looked at a few of the Proverbs and their content and their meaning, and perhaps you have favorite ones, as I do, ones that you've read more than the others, but this would be, again, a good study for you to do, to just take a month or two and carefully and, and prayerfully and thoughtfully read these admonitions of Scripture, these uh, uh, bits packed full of the dynamite of truth, these sayings that are full of wisdom and knowledge and consider their principle and their implications for our lives. We really want to discuss at the end of this really the, the constitution of this book and, and, and perhaps we see this in extreme with the book of Ecclesiastes and we're going to discuss that the next time when we deal with that. When you deal with the Ecclesiastes of course which is written on a theme you absolutely have to understand what the theme was and what Solomon was writing about to understand the content of the book. And of course the wisdom of Ecclesiastes is seen as, as all the wisdom of human beings apart from God, everything that's said and thought and believed under the sun. And of course the summation of that is that all of that is empty and useless without God and His wisdom. But of course even as we view this book of Proverbs, we, we believe that it's Scripture because we believe that the Holy Spirit took these ideas of, from human wisdom that human beings wrote and that Solomon wrote and a few other people wrote. And he took the part that he wanted to from the great body of wisdom that Solomon said and wrote. And he placed them here in the context for his particular purposes and reasons. But we must consider that they are proverbs and that they are sayings of men and, and not that they're wrong. I don't mean to imply that they're not true. But for instance, we are told that under certain circumstances a thing is true and not true both at the same time. For instance, in one verse, we are told not to rebuke a fool because of what that will produce. And in the next verse, we are told to rebuke a fool because of what that will produce. And here, of course, we have a paradox. And there are many paradoxes in Scripture. Two things that don't seem to be possible to be true at the same time, but when the two truths are combined, a, a central truth comes, which is true, though two, it seems to contain two opposite truths. And, and you have to consider this as you read Proverbs that the things that are said here may contradict other principles in that the context in which they're said in Proverbs may be a limited context. A thing that's true sometimes or most of the time but is not always true. And the context, of course, will determine that. And I'm not meaning to say that there. I'm not meaning to say that this isn't what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. It is, and I believe that the Bible is fully inspired. I'm not saying that these are inspired in a different way or on a different level, or they contain untruths. I'm just saying that you have to determine the meaning of the proverb in the context in which it is given in Proverbs. 
and consider that not every proverb will always be meant to be true in all times and in all situations. But of course there are very few that seem to conflict at all and most of them are obviously true and stand in their own individual saying and wait, although when you come to you know, when you come to things like the paradoxes and the things in one place you have seemingly saying one thing and another place seemingly saying another, then we reconcile that truth by looking at both things in view of the truth in Scripture as a whole. And we know that there is really no conflict in the Word of God. But we need to consider the, the information and its content and its context any time that we... Uh, Anytime we study the Word of God, for instance, there are things that the devil is recorded to say in the Scripture. And of course there is, uh, you can take one verse from one place and hook it to another verse in another place, and it's often been used uh, that uh, uh, th this thing, uh, you know, that where it said, go and do what thou doest quickly, and then you can take any other verse and hook that with it. And, uh, of course, you can change the meaning of what Scripture intends. So you always have to view things in context. And the Bible does record the words of Satan. And it does record, the, like in the accusations of the people in Job, uh, what they said about Job's condition wasn't correct. And what they, their ideas religiously about God were often incomplete and incorrect though they contained some truth in what they said. And so we have to always look at everything for the purpose and in the context in which it is given. And so we do in this, this study of Proverbs too. Just as I urged you to in the book of Job, I urge you to do in, in Psalms and, and say, we, there was so much there. And I love the book of Psalms and I love the book of Proverbs. There's so much there that in just a brief half an hour discussion, we, we can only begin to categorize the things that are there and give you some kind of idea about the information. And, and, and most of you, as, as people that have read your Bible, would know most of this already. I know I'm not plowing new ground with you today, perhaps, but and especially if you are a new convert in the Word of the Lord, these perspectives and these summaries will be helpful to you to categorize the parts and the divisions of the Old Testament together in a way that maybe you can better understand them. And, and, and so we do today. That this section, this whole section of poetry, uh, the poetic books, which is also contains the wisdom literature, begins with Job and ends with uh, the Song of Solomon. And so this division... The content of it is one of this idea of wisdom literature and Proverbs and the uh, human experiences that we have in Psalms, the praises and the worships and the experiential thoughts of, of David and others as they experience God's working in their life. And they're a great benefit to our spiritual and our devotional life especially. And of course some of the Psalms because of their messianic content uh, and their prophetic views contain important scriptures about the futures and principles. And so study them and on the basis of the reason and the content and the theme that they are and, and better understand what God has said and His purpose in putting them in His Word today, I pray. Amen.